Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on spans and proportions of common spanning systems. This is from uh, chapter one, section seven, and we've added a point two here to correspond to steel. And in this first video, which is video A, we're talking about spans and proportions of steel beams. And by that, we typically mean a solid web elements that are um, spanning in a single direction. Um, and that direction may be horizontal or it might be vertical to resist wind loads, but that's how we're defining beams at this moment. So this could be a horizontal beam in a roof that resists snow load or live load on the roof, or it could be a, a vertical beam in a wall that's resisting the hor horizontal force of wind. But in any case, by beams, we automatically mean something where the forces are perpendicular to the long axis of the member. So in our spans and proportions guidelines, <clears throat> you'll see a series of structural types that begin with really simple things like uh, one and a half inch ca corrugated uh, roof decking or uh, three inch corrugated roof decking. And while we're about it, we're going to mention some things having to do with floors, which are a little more complicated, but they're worth mentioning. Then you'll notice here we have wide flanges, which turn out to be uh, structures with a shape like this, and they're rolled. Um, and we can use them either as simple span where they're supported on each end, or we can use them as a cantilever where they're supported uh, just at one end. And so there has to be a really good sturdy moment connection here to keep these things from toppling down like so. In this case, we're going to get some deflection like this and we'll have a pin joint effectively a roller joint at each end so that the member can rotate and it's not restrained at that point. So this is referred to as a simple span structure, um, which has basically a pin joint and or a roller joint at each end. Um, you'll notice in every case there's a certain length that these things are drawn at. So for example for the wide flange simple span we note that about as far as we can go with that is 80 feet. Um, you'll also notice there are two uh, drawings. One shows the shallowest and the other the sort of deepest proportions that we're likely to see. Now, under extreme circumstances, you can always do a beam that's deeper than L over 18, but you need to understand that means you're making your building taller, which adds cost that may be unnecessary. Um, it also means that the web of this member becomes very tall and thin and more vulnerable to buckling. Uh, but generally speaking, it's always more efficient to make your beam deeper in terms of improving stiffness and also the ability to resist moment failure but then web buckling or shear failure becomes a more likely uh, mode of uh, failure. Then we have plate girders which get welded up. Um, plate girders can be much deeper. The deepest depth for the wide flanges that are rolled is 42 inches. Um, plate girders can be made up to 8 feet deep and if you want to, and that's a sort of typical uh, width for steel plate. You can nowadays get even wider than that, and you can also weld up plate to, you know, if you've got eight foot wide um, steel plate, you can weld two pieces together and get 16 feet. But typically, we don't go much, uh, we don't go that deep because uh, the, the tendency of the plate girder web to buckle becomes too severe. Um, but here you see the sort of typical deepest proportion, and here you see the sort of typical shallowest proportion. So that's the pattern you see. You see two beams or two elements, one above the other, um, which defines, for example, in the case of plate girders, we'd be going up to 200. And we can do anything less than that, but we don't tend to bother with plate girders uh, if we can do it with wide flanges. So it's kind of like up to 80 feet is sort of the domain of wide flange and from 80 to 200 is the domain of plate girders. Uh, the one exception to this pattern that we have of uh, um, showing two members has to do with decking. In the case of decking we have a fairly limited number of depths uh, we can do one inch, one and a half inch, two inches, and three inches, and so forth. But our most common depths are one and a half inch and three inches. 
So it's not like we fine-tune the depth the same way that we would for wide flanges. In the case of wide flanges, uh, we have many different depths and weights of members, so we would really look at this issue of proportions carefully. In the case of inch and a half decking, uh, we can span up to typically about 8 feet. With 3 inch, we can span up to about 16 feet. And that represents the extreme limit. So one of the things you're encouraged to do is not every single time make something the shallowest it can possibly be or the longest span it can possibly be. You would only go 16 feet if you had some really compelling reason to do that. But typically you'll use some substructure that uh, reduces that 16 feet down to 12 or 10 or possibly even 8. So for the shallowest proportions, which is what's the case here, and here in these diagrams. And by the way, we didn't show deeper because at the scale of this sketch, it's, it's hard to even see it. I mean, we're at the point right now where we're sort of looking at the width of two lines here uh, rather than the spacing of the two lines. But so this is the one exception to the sort of how this whole system of diagrams is organized is that we're only showing one proportion uh, and that's purely a graphic issue. But when you think about this, think this is 16 feet is as far as you're going to go with this three inch corrugated roof decking and that'll only be under light loads and where you have you have continuity of the decking over interior supports and so forth um, but it can be something shallower than that but at that proportion the depth is equal to l over 64 or in other words is equal to about 0.16, 0 0.016 times the length so when we go do a building models of these things um, you're going to look at uh, whatever material you've got, like if it's a twentieth of an inch, um, by this proportion, that twentieth of an inch is equal to L over 64. So in other words, if we wanted to know how far you can span with a twentieth of an inch, you multiply 64 times a twentieth of an inch, which is 0 0.05, and you discover that that's about 3.2 inches if I did my arithmetic correctly there. So when we look at models and we see you've used 1 20th inch uh, chipboard, we better not see it spanning more than that 3.2 inches. Uh, otherwise you're beyond the proportions that are allowed here. Okay, so uh, let's talk about decking. There's inch and a half deep roof decking that looks something like this. It tends to be smooth. It's a little narrower on the bottom than it is on the top, and that's to provide as much broad surface to support the um, rigid insulation, so the rigid insulation is less likely to get damaged. Uh, ideally, from a structural point of view, the width on the top and the width, this width right here on the bottom and that width on the top would be equal, but again, we're making a compromise to help support the decking. Uh, we also have three inch deep uh, roof decking that looks something like this. You'll notice that all the roof decking, which is going to have rigid insulation on it and then a recovery board and some kind of a membrane, um, it's smooth. These surfaces are smooth because we're not pouring any concrete and we're tr not trying to get any composite action. So this is what it looks like if it's galvanized and you're looking up at it from the underside. Um, and now I'll talk briefly about floor decking. Floor decking is a little more complicated because um, the actual decking is mostly limited by uh, is it deep enough for the span to support the concrete that's going to go on top of it. Um, once the concrete is cured, the composite action occurs between the concrete and the decking. So you'll notice these uh, embossments on the side here. They are to assure proper in engagement or composite action between the steel deck and the concrete. Once the concrete cures, it acts in compression. The steel decking acts in tension. But before the concrete cures, it's the dead load on the decking. And the full depth from a structural point of view is just the depth of the decking. And typically, that decking has the same structural limitations or the same proportions uh, limitations of the L over 64. Um, the challenge becomes that once it's all put together in composite action, the overall depth of the composite is typically on the order of at least twice the depth of the corrugations. 
So if we go back to our uh, spans and proportions tables here, we would say, you'll notice this all says for roof decking, um, but if we were going to apply it to floors, we would have this same rule of proportion to the actual decking itself, but then the combined or composite decking of steel and concrete would typically be more on the order of twice this deep or maybe even three times this deep. So the answer for the overall composite of corrugated decking plus concrete would be more like L over 30 or maybe even L over 20. So if you do models that have floor structures in them, uh, the advice would be do L over 20 to, to kind of indicate a logical proportion for that floor decking. All right, so we have one and a half inch deep, inch deep uh, corrugations, and then you can also get three inch deep corrugations. And you'll notice here, this embossing is to assure composite action between the decking and the concrete. There are also shear studs here that assure con composite action between the concrete and the top cord of this truss. This is a view from down below, and the pattern of this embossing varies from company to company, but whatever happens, there need to be enough of those nubby portions, and they need to be deep enough to assure proper engagement with the concrete. And it's a system that works extremely well. Here's another view of that uh, material. Okay, so again, uh, we've said for roofs, these are the proportions that you're typically going to say are the shallowest, and floors should be about twice or three times as deep at a given span. So more like L over 30 or L over 20. All right, so let's talk about wide flange beams. These are rolled sections. This is uh, the so-called I section, but uh, the, the current terminology is wide flange because when the I sections came out, they couldn't do a flange that wide, and then they figured out how to roll it, and subsequently the original I beams, which were fairly narrow in their flanges, are no longer the standard. The standard is a so-called wide flange beam. So this shows some of these beams underneath the floor, and uh, if we were going to talk about uh, depth of those, uh, the shallowest would be L over 28. The typical sort of limitation on the depth would be L over 18, but again, I'm, I point out that this depth could be much deeper depending upon the, the loads that are involved and how it's being used in the building. But for, say, typical spanning conditions in a roof or a floor, L over 18 is about as deep as you're going to go. So in the case of this particular set of beams, these were L over 28, but you need to be careful that's actually not the true depth because these beams were 12 inches deep and then they were in composite action with a six inch slab above. So they're actually 18 inches deep and instead of being L over uh, 28, they're closer to a much deeper uh, sort of proportion because the actual beam is the combination of the steel plus the concrete on the top. So again, I say, uh, don't just migrate to the shallowest thing you possibly can because that's typically not going to be the economic optimum. The beam's going to have to be heavier because it doesn't have good proportions uh, for, for generating the internal resisting moment. While I'm on this diagram, you'll notice a really important sort of general rule we have, which is with a given cross section, you can only span half as far with a cantilever as you can with a simple span. So here we have L over 28 for the simple span, and that means we have L over 14 for the cantilever. And here we had L over 18 for the simple span, and now we have L over 9 uh, for the cantilever. So this shows another uh, beam. This is in a roofing situation. This beam was actually closer to, its depth was closer to 1 24th of its length. It might have been 1 28th if it was serving the function of these trusses, but we almost never use solid web beams as the first line of support under a roof because the loads are so small and these open web trusses can be given greater depth uh, without buckling of the webbing material and as a consequence they're always more efficient. So you almost never see solid web beams uh, serving as these joists, but you will see them occasionally serving as the girder uh, 
Um, but we can equally well do this girder out of a, an open web joist also, I mean a, a, a truss as well. Okay, so let's talk about plate girders. Plate girders typically have sh deeper proportions. So instead of L over 28, we're talking L over 20 and L over 15 for the proportions. And the reason is it's very expensive to roll deep wide flanges and that uh, has an impact on the economics of what represents good proportions for those uh, plate girders. We've already made the commitment to do all the welding and everything and we can typically get webs that are as deep as we need them. So we tend to make plate girders deeper, more in the range of L over 20 for the shallowest and L over 15 for the deepest. So here are some plate girders on um, a building in New York called Number One Liberty Plaza. And the distinction of this building is it's got these sturdy columns, which are then moment connected to beams on each side. So the column, the portion of the column that's between two beams is pretty small and it's really thick and chunky. So the entire stability of this building is achieved by connecting these very deep um, plate girders, which we call spandrel beams in this particular case. These deep plate girders are moment connected by welded connections to the columns. And you'll notice they made these as deep as they, they could. So in fact, these windows, which may be only uh, five or six feet deep, um, are, are pretty ample windows. And then the spandrel beam is even deeper than that. So it's more in the nature of uh, seven feet deep. Um, and that's a very sturdy deep beam, which is very efficiently made as a plate girder. Uh, but these are pretty thin webs and you'll notice some ripples in the webs there uh, due to welding and loading conditions and what sort of wh whatever. But uh, even though there are some ripples in them, they've been braced frequently enough that they're not going to exhibit lateral buckling, -ish, lateral buckling of the plate or in other words, elastic instability. Uh, it's a very deep spandrel beam producing a very deep rigid frame structure, which is basically the entire depth of this facade. So it's a, a Virendil truss or a rigid frame. Um, here's another example of a plate girder. You'd never see a rolled section that has very old, variable depth like this. Nobody knows how to do a rolling system that would do that. But we can cut the plates with this uh, triangular sort of shape. And then they've welded some stiffeners on here. But the whole point of this is they've found this expressive way of making the structure deep in the middle and shallower near the ends. But the proportions are still the proportions of plate girders. So the depth of this would typically be somewhere between 1 20th and 1 15th of the depth. In this case, I would guess it's closer to 1 20th because this is a roof structure and the loads are fairly light. And in fact, this is in Phoenix and I don't think they ever have any snow load there. Um, although I haven't read the local code. Okay, so plate girders also allow us to do other things like you'll notice across this joint, the width of the flange has suddenly increased from that to something much wider. And then there's a welded connection here that allows the flange to get deeper so or thicker. So here we have a fairly thin flange and there we have a thick one, all of which is accounting for the fact that the continuous beam over the support has intense compression in this bottom flange and it's been thickened in order to uh, properly deal with that. The other interesting thing here is these connections are occurring at a place where there's not much moment so we can bolt those and they become the field connection which is really pretty cool because basically this section comes pre-assembled and then this section is pre-assembled and pre-fabricated and so forth. So is this. So in fact, we've got three beams of shorter lengths, which are easier to transport than we would if we had a beam that started at one side and ended on this uh, element in the center. Uh, we can also further express, express the freedom of the plate girder. Here you'll notice we've got something of uniform depth and uniform flange. And then at this point, uh, the flange changes and it becomes thicker. And it also is curved so that we get greater depth at the center where we have this very intense kind of internal moment associated with the continuity 
over this support, which is creating a huge uh, force upward at that point. That ends our discussion of spans and proportions of steel beams.